series on Iran. We've already had two excellent talks, and we had a book discussion tonight as well. And tonight we have um, a graduate student uh, joining us from uh, UW Madison, Hamid Reza Nasiri. Uh, he's got an MA in film studies, an MA in cinema from the UW Madison, from Tehran, University, University of Tehran in Iran as well. Uh, looks like he switched gears. He originally got a bachelor's in electrical engineering, decided to become a cinematographer and study cinematography. And he's already developed like an impressive CV. I have to say, I'm very envious. He's won a bunch of honors and awards in teaching. He's won an International Studies Research Fellowship from the UW Madison. Published some articles on filmmakers like Michael Haneke, uh, analyzing his cinematography. He's given talks uh, and lectures at uh, Ithaca, New York, at film conferences in Montreal, and Quebec, on Iranian underground cinema, on uh, No Country for Old Men, uh, Coen Brothers movies. So. Yeah, I think we're really blessed again to have another great speaker here tonight. So please uh, join me in welcoming. Uh, Iranian underground cinema, but then after that, I thought that like it's better to give a broad overview of how Iranian cinema is working, including the industry and different modes of production that is actually now um, active in Iran. Because like, um, if I want to talk about uh, just underground cinema, I will just repeat the whole suppression, censorship, and everything, and it will be again like repeating the same story maybe. Um, but now I want to just like maybe give a different view of Iranian cinema from what uh, you may have heard. Just like, can you raise your hands if you have seen any Iranian film at all? Okay, cool. So actually this is now even better. Um, <laughs> I mean, the change of the title from just underground cinema to the whole Iranian cinema. Um, I hope this actually like excites you to explore Iranian cinema in the future. So, the agenda for today is that like I again have to talk about because like supervision and censorship by the state is part of the Iranian film industry. So at first, I'm going to talk about that. But then I shift my attention to the modes of production. And by that, I mean how are the films financed and what are the different types of films that are produced in Iran. Okay. So why is Iranian cinema important? Um, for one thing is that, um, well, it started in 1897, just two years after cinema's birth. And so it's a pretty old cinema, like um, that. It's not um, like some small nation cinemas that started like maybe like 40 or 50 years ago. Um, if we flash forward to now quickly, nowadays we have like more than 100 feature films produced every year, which puts Iran um, in one one of the like top 14 countries in the world. So it's a pretty productive, is it too loud? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Is it too loud? <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, it's a pretty productive cinema. It's not just like a group of filmmakers, a small group of filmmakers that will just like make films together. Um, it is an industry. There, are, there is a like very diversity. There is a big diversity in terms of the types of films that are made in Iran. So the typical Iranian cinema that gets abroad in festivals and 
um, in theaters abroad, they're usually like the first part, the art house cinema. I will talk about um, them in detail, that like what do we mean, but like if you have heard the name of Panahi, Kiarostami, those are the people that are actually like, um, their films get out like into festivals and get a lot of attention. But other than that, there's mainstream cinema, which is kind of like what we know as like genre films, like comedies. Uh, melodramas, dramas, animations, like big productions. Um, so those are the films that like, um, and usually like box office hits are actually like comedies. And I will talk about that like we have even different subgenres of comedies from romantic comedy to dark comedy and everything. And we have also like underground cinema. Um, this is also what people might not know because like maybe like under suppression it's hard to actually have an underground cinema, but under suppression we can we will have underground cinema because of suppression. There are like some now new young filmmakers who don't want to follow the rules, and that's why there's underground cinema. Again, I will talk about them in detail more. Another reason that like why Iranian cinema is important: Iranian films have won almost all major film festival awards around the world. So from Oscars and Golden Globe to Cannes and Venice and Berlin, um, Iranian cinema has a like, huge collection of uh, festival awards. And so always has multiple films and filmmakers on the best list. The last one of them was the 100 best films um, of the 21st century that BBC released by voting um, that's like hundreds of like or tens of scholars and critics around the world voted for that. And there are a couple of Iranian films there too, including a separation and ten. Another reason why Iranian cinema is important is that like it has been really influential on world cinema. And like Filmmakers, especially European filmmakers, from Haneke and Bilga Ceylan um, to Christian Mungio. Haneke is Austrian, Bilga Ceylan is Turkish, Christian Mungio is Romanian. To also, like even like American and Canadian directors, such as Jim Jarmusch, Ramin Barani, and Sarah Pauli, they have been influenced by the um, Iranian filmmakers. And it has been praised a lot by scholars and um, critics. And our own David Bordwell, who, who is like one of the biggest film scholars in the world and is actually a retired professor at UW-Madison, and whose textbooks are actually taught around the world, says that like Iranian directors understand suspense better than almost anybody working today. And there's actually a lot of entries on his blog that you can read on Iranian cinema. And finally, Iranian cinema is very important because it gives a truer picture of Iran, especially now modern Iran, than all you can see in the media. If you watch Iranian films, you will have a better grasp of like, how Iranian society is working now. But how does this cinema work? Okay, so we get back to the old story. Censorship and supervision by the state. This is actually important. And this is actually drawn by one of the um, famous Iranian cartoonists who is now um, in like, kind of like forced immigration. Um, so there are four types of permits that like, filmmakers have to get from production to exhibition so that they can have their films produced and then get their films into theaters. The first phase is production permit before they get their films produced. And then when they want to get their films exhibited, they have to get an exhibition permit. But it's not enough to have their films in international theaters. So they have to get <coughs> international exhibition permit for that. And then there's another permit for home video release permit. 
So if they want to release it on DVD or streaming, they have to get on the permit again. And why are there different exhibition permits? Because there are actually different rules. Um, like um, for the actual theatrical release, um, the rules are looser than for home video release permits. Because they say that like, well, less people go to actual theaters than um, the people who want DVDs. So the rules get tighter for home video release. And the rules get tighter even for international exhibition permit, especially when it comes to social films, because the regime doesn't want to give a, like, a dark picture of Iran, or the uh, films that are actually like um, criticizing the system. They're very sensitive to those things. Okay, so how is a production permit received by a filmmaker? So um, the basic procedure is that the producer goes to the Ministry of Culture with a screenplay or synopsis of the film. Nowadays, synopsis is more common. Before it was like a detailed screenplay, but now a synop and they just give a synopsis of the film. They fill out the form, and they introduce the cast and crew of the film. So what is there on that for? So the main thing is that like, they have to actually sign a form that says that they follow Islamic and moral rules, Iran's cultural and social criteria, the rule of filmmaking in the Islamic Republic of Iran, hijab and Islamic dressing, no physical contact between male and female actors, no use of offensive, dairy, or erotic words, and respecting religious and custom limits and privacy in presenting the relationship between women and men or girls and boys. And also no drug use by the characters, especially women and the youth. As I will say later, it, you see that like, there are some actually ambiguous and vague things here. That's like, what do you mean like Iran's culture and social criteria? What do you mean Islamic mor and moral rules? Like moral, what are the moral rules? And even just like the rule of filmmaking in Islamic Republic of Iran. Actually, this ambiguity is helpful for the filmmakers because then they can negotiate more on getting the permits from production permit to exhibition permit. Um, I will talk about the looseness and tightness of the censorship later again. But yeah, the vagueness of some concepts um, gives um, space for personal interpretations and negotiability. And as I will say later, the censorship is not that strict. There is also an unwritten rule, which they call, like in Persian, they call it Siyanamai, and it means giving a dark image of Iran, a dark, untrue image of Iran society or Iran's regime. This is especially, like, this is kind of one of the most important things for the state, that they really, um, if anything criticizes them or show, like, um, the working class is struggling with their lives and anything. This is the word that they use very common. Siyanamai, giving a dark image of Iran. Like Panahi is like actually like the most important person who is accused of this. And then there is exhibition permit. And for that, just the film is submitted. Again, to the Ministry of Culture. And as I said, there are three different permits the dom for the domestic screening, for the international screening, and for home video release. And this is actually, this is a card that they get as a permit. This is actually a card. So, yeah, so there's a tight and loose censorship. It's not too tight, it's not too loose. It's negotiable. And it depends on who is in charge, who is the minister of culture, who, is the, who are in the committee that are actually deciding on giving the permission, and 
who even like who is in parliament that want that they can help the filmmakers or actually like um, produce more obstacles for the filmmaker. These are all important. Especially on socio-political issues, it is more negotiable. Where it is not negotiable at all is like some things like nudity or sex. That's not negotiable. Um, so the changes in the production permit could be just like changing some parts of the screenplay or even sometimes changing some cast and crew if they're banned from um, participating in films. And for, pro for exhibition permits, um, the negotiation could actually end up to cutting out parts of the film, which could be just a couple of frames of the film, to like even banning the whole thing. And usually bans are not permanent bans. So usually the films get released after like maybe the government changes or just the Minister of Culture changes. There are very few films that get banned forever. So again, this shows how um, kind of um, loose the censorship is. Okay, after talking about that, we need to know that like how the films get financed. So there are Three different modes, three main modes. One of them is actually the films that are directly financed by the state. Like there are organizations and institutions that are um, actually organized by state and they're financed by state. And they give the whole money to the producer and they produce their films. This is usually for the art house films um, that are not very controversial in terms of like socio-political issues, and the films that are about like religion, or like propaganda, or like historical figures. These are usually the films that completely get financed by the state. There are also like independent films, which are like individuals and like companies uh, finance. Um, the films, it's like independent films in Iranian cinema is kind of different from American cinema. When we say independent cinema here, it's like, oh, against like, like outside of Hollywood, outside of the studio system. But there's nothing like studio in Iran. But there are filmmaking companies. There are filmmaking institutions. And they're usually run by film producers, like individual film producers. Um, so that's how like independent filmmaking in Iran is actually defined. And the last one is the combination of like getting financed by the state and getting financed by individuals, the producers or the institutions. This is another mode of getting uh, money for the films. I have to say, yes, this is the majority of the films that are produced in Iran. In terms of equipment, like before we got the digital technology, um, like cameras and other things were like in the hand of the state. So it was the state who would give the camera to a filmmaker or not. So they had to wait, there was like long waits, there wasn't that many camera. Um, that's why like nowadays we're producing even more films. And uh, more films that underground films get produced or um, different types of films get produced. It's because, like, thanks to digital technology that now everyone has access to the best cameras for, like, a um, couple thousand dollars. Okay, so with all these, like, um, censorship, supervision, and like maybe not having a studio system or like big uh, producers and everything, still Iranian cinema has managed throughout the years to be a very rich and diverse cinema. So now it's the time to actually shift our focus to uh, different types of films that get produced. Like the main four categories that I have is the art house cinema, mainstream cinema, 
and the films that are kind of the bridge between art house and mainstream cinema and the underground cinema. So what do we mean by art house cinema? Again, it's a typical Iranian cinema that you may get in theaters and in festivals. And they're usually slow films, like they're called like poetic, and they have limited audience, like educated audience, intellectuals, and they're festival favorites. Like festivals love them because they're kind of like they're showing an exotic picture of Iran. Because like they they happen usually like in rural areas or like working class. Um, so it's kind of an exotic picture. They usually have non-professional actors, and they're very close to what we know as Italian neorealism in terms of their style and their, their realism. And sometimes, yes, magical realism. So to show you an example, so the, the most important director there in the art house cinema is actually Kiarostami, who died a couple of months ago. And he's like a major figure in Iranian war cinema. So this is, I'm going to show you just the very last scene of the film. So it's about, the film is about a group of uh, filmmakers that go to a village after a major earthquake and want to make a film about the life after the earthquake. So the two actors here, uh, a guy and a girl, so the guy get, uh, falls in love with the uh, girl like, in, like outside of that film in the film. Right? So, um, but there are spouses in the film, in the film. Right? Does that make sense? Um, so this is the very last scene of the film where he's trying so hard to get the girl. Like, like, this, like this happens throughout the film. No. You don't really need a, to know necessarily the dialogue. It, it's just very visual. He's just trying to convince her. This is the director of the film and the film.
so you see very visual. It's a, it's, it, it's a short film on its own. It says, and like, no word, and you get the story. Um, the emphasis on like landscapes is like one of the signs, and like those like curvy roads, it's a sign of like Kiarostami. If you see an Iranian film with those roads, it's made by Kiarostami. And um, like in Very's Friend's Home, which was like one of his first feature films and the one that like made him famous like internationally, he made one of those roles just for his film. <laughs> okay, so this was called Through the Olive Trees. So yeah, this is Kiarosemi. And just to name a few of the major directors, Kiarostami, Panahi, that you have heard a lot, probably, and Mahmoud Bav, Qobadi, like these are directors that like, when you, name, when you say Iranian cinema, these are the first names that you might hear from people. And at the same time, while there are kind of the mobiles, there are still many young filmmakers um, who are making films in this art house cinema. And the last one of them was like, um, that um, she had a film in Cannes last year, um, Aida Panahanda, and the film is called Nahid. So, after that, let's talk about the mainstream films. And this is what usually doesn't get out of Iran. Um, they're usually genre films, and maybe the most important um, part of those genre films are actually comedies. There's so many comedies made in Iran, um, and like there are so many subgenres of like those comedies, like from romantic comedies to dark comedies, and like even musical comedy. And there are actually there's a range of lowbrow to highbrow comedies. So there's comedy for like every um, um, type of like educated people to uneducated people, and like low class to high class, and. Usually, um, there are like some huge box office heads, and um, usually the best um, sellers like in, in the films are comedies, and there are of course some failures. Um, so in that sense, it's close to American cinema too. Like if if we actually exclude the superhero movies that we don't have, like comedies also in American cinema get like usually they are the box office heads and there are some failures too. So, and comedies actually has helped, uh, have helped filmmakers to talk about very important and controversial issues and try to get away from controversy by just saying that like, oh, it's just comedy. But comedies usually become even more controversial. So this is, um, the film The Lizard that was made in 2004, it's a story of a thief who escapes from prison by stealing a religious cleric's clothing and um, escapes from prison. Then what happens is that like, then he goes to the border to escape the country. But then on the train, some people actually mistakes him with an actual religious cleric who was supposed to go on a missionary to a small village on the border. So now he's stuck. So, but he uses that to stay um, safe in that village until he can get um, out of the country. So this, um, this was really controversial and so many religious clerks of course didn't like it. And it couldn't get shown more than like two or three weeks. And even in, um, and it's like back like 12 years ago, and in some religious cities, there were even like attacks to theaters by some very uh, religious people. So, but at the same time, I have to say, this is the film that is also praised by many religious people because they, they believe, and they truly believe, that it shows a very um, good and new picture of Islam as a like, peaceful um, religion, that, and religion um, in general, not just Islam. So interestingly, this is one of the favorite films of actually the Supreme Leader. 
So this is one of the um, things. He's in the village now. He's the thief that stole the clothing. That, that singing is important because actually singing like music uh, is a bad thing in Islam and it, they, they shouldn't sing inside the mosque especially so but he doesn't care <laughs> and it's very interesting because like because he gives a, a more open um, um, like in, a version of religion like the mosque that was just like those um, like few people there in the beginning of the film in the end of the film so many people go to mosque to, to say their prayers because now they see it as a, as a more open that they, they feel that they can be in the religious community too so that's why uh, many religious people also defend this film Okay, so, so yeah, there are so many comedies also made in Iran. There are melodramas that they used to be very popular. They were super popular before revolution, but after revolution, because art house cinema like got in top, then the Iranian cinema changed and the taste of the people also changed at the same time. Um, so melodramas are not as popular as before the revolution, but they are still made and they have their own audience. The dramas, which could be like maybe the biggest part of mainstream films, and they're usually about the modern society, the middle class, and their problems that they're struggling from family problems, usually. Um, and sometimes it gets to like social problems and political problems. The war films, which um, the state calls it um, sacred defense, um, and it is about the Iran-Iraq war that happened uh, from 1980 to 88. Um, these are, uh, so Duel is one of those war films that was like maybe the uh, has had the highest budget among the war films. So, this is actually part of that film. You don't, again, like, this doesn't have um, subtitles, but I'm showing it to you to just, like, give a sense of how Iranian war films look like. Yeah. It could get really loud that there are explosions.
Yeah, as you, as you can see, it was a very unequal war, and that's why it's called like sacred defense, because it was kind of like magical how Iran managed to stay through the war. Okay. Um, so there were also like action films there, um, that were like popular in 1980s. Um, they're not action films made anymore, and it, it was usually about like one like uh, hero who was like working um, for the state to actually uh, increase the security of the borders against the smugglers, against the people who wanted to get through the borders. So that was usually like the theme of the action films. And there are also like period films that are usually about historical and religious figures. There are animations made in Iran, which is now like small, it's not as big as in uh, what we have in Japan or um, US, but it is growing. Um, so that's also an issue. It's made by individuals again. It's not they're not like animation studios, um, as you see here, or in Japan. There are also big productions that are um, usually. I have to say that like maybe like all of them are financed by the state because the kind of money that they need um, only state can provide that kind of money, and they're mostly either like historical films or like war films, like sacred defense films. So there is, um, this is like a big part of Iranian cinema as well, that's like a bridge between um, art house and mainstream films. And what they mean is that like, um, these are kind of like sophisticated, multi-layered films that's like, that can appeal to a huge range of the audience. Right? So, and they're mostly about the middle class, which is the largest and uh, most educated class in Iran. And nowadays, also, many young directors are like working in that venue to talk about the socio political issues in Iran. So, in terms of style, they're um, um, sophisticated, in terms of content, they're multi layered, and they can um, actually get a lot of attention from um, uneducated to educated, from um, low class to high class. Um, by law, I mean working. I, do, I shouldn't use law. I mean working class to um, like bourgeois um, class. So um, the major directors, um, like the most important director in that venue is that actually like Asghar Farhadi. I don't know if you have heard of him, but he won Oscar like a couple of years ago for a separation. And he's now, um, after Kiarostami, maybe like the most famous director um, of Iran. And the interesting thing is that like, unlike Kiarostami, he's not giving an exotic picture of Iran. He's giving a like, very modern picture of Iran. Uh, which the Western audience find it interesting in terms of that, like they see that, like how close Iranian modern society is to Western society, and that's what they uh, don't um, see in um, in the media or like um, in other Iranian films. So I'm gonna skip that. Um, this is also like um, Beizai, who is now actually like. Uh, lecturing in Stanford University is also like a great uh, filmmaker in that venue, and I want to show um, one of his uh, films, but I don't think we have time for that. But I'm going to show Farhadi's um, a separation, just a scene of that. Um, this is important because you can see both working class and middle class, and how a separation means a lot of things. It's about a separation of a couple because one of them wants to leave the country to go to Canada and the other one doesn't. It's about a separation of classes, working class and middle class. And um, it's about the separation between the state and the people as well and between the court system and the people. So there are so many separations that you can see in this film. And so... I don't know what I can. 
it doesn't let me to go before. Okay. So this is um, this happens in the court after. So this guy named Nader um, got divorced from um, his wife on that issue of like immigration. He wants to stay in Iran, but the wife wants to leave Iran. And then uh, they got divorced, so he hired um, this woman as a nurse to actually um, take care of his uh, father, who has Alzheimer. And then what happened is that like one day she left, and when he came back, he thought that she actually stole something um, from him. So she pushed, uh, so he pushed her down the stairs. And then, well, she was pregnant, and the um, child um, actually kind of like um, died. So this is what happens in the court. Oops, I don't know what. Oh, did I just close it? I don't know why it doesn't let me to show it. It's, it was really hard to find this phone, so I had to use Okay. شده. دقیقا همون مقداری که دستمزدهشون بوده. سر این دامون شو 
So yeah, you even see the anger from like the working class guy toward the middle class. That that separation is also about the class gap in Iran. Okay, so then finally we have the underground films, and this is as I said, it's relatively new thanks to the digital technologies. That now um, they don't need to get the permission permits and then get the camera and other equipment from the state. They can just like um, make their films on their own. Of course, there are some limitations because, like, if you want to shoot um, on the street and like close the street and other things, then you can't do that. So there are some things that they have to consider. But at the same time, although there are some films that are considered as underground because they don't get the production permit, and this, like Panahi's last three films, including Taxi, which you might go see, and I highly encourage you to go see. It's a, it's a funny and sophisticated film, like both at the same time. And yes, yeah, and we're screening it, and I highly encourage you to go see it. And I will show you the trailer in the very end of my talk. And th these are the films that are considered as underground because they, they didn't get any permission. They didn't get any production permit, and they just um, got made. Um, but there are also some films that are considered as underground that although they actually got the production permit, but they got banned from um, showing in theaters, being shown in theaters because they actually didn't follow the censorship rules. So one of Panahi's films, Offside, which is actually an interesting story because he wanted to make Offside, which is about um, the ban of like, um, girls getting into a stadium like, um, to watch soccer. And it's about that. And he gave, of course, if you give that screenplay to the state, they don't approve it. They don't give the production permit. But what he did was that he gave a dummy screenplay. He got the production permit. He could use like um, even subsidies, and he could use the um, like a stadium and other things. But um, finally, um, it didn't get shown in theaters, and now it is considered as an underground film. Um, the same thing happened for my Tehran for sale. That I will show you a clip of it um, shortly. And there are also some not clear situations that sometimes films get shown even in theater for a week for two weeks, and then suddenly they become underground because there's like controversy, there's controversy around that. That lizard that I showed you, you cannot get a, a like legal DVD of it like in Iran. It's now an underground film, although it was shown in, um, in theaters. So yeah, when you don't have a production permit, usually um, you can't get an exhibition permit, so they don't get theatrical exhibition. Filmmakers can face ban from filmmaking leaving the country or even jail. So Panahi like, was making a film without, product, without permit, and they um, arrested him. And although he got released pretty soon, but he's now banned from like, legal filmmaking. Um, and he's banned from leaving the country. And I have to say, he has made like, some of his best films like, since he was banned. So he's pretty a creative genius. That's like he's, he, um, he's still working and very productive. So. In terms of the style and content, 
um, they can have the characteristics of any of the previous three ones. They can be art house, like slow poetic films. They can be mainstream films, entertaining films, and they can be something in between, which is usually that one. They're like usually in between art house and mainstream films. Um, but one thing I want to say is that like sometimes some scholars and critics consider the films that are made outside of Iran by Iranians as underground cinema when they are critical of the system or the, when they don't follow the censorship rules. I don't think we can call them underground cinema because they're working, they're not working under all those limitations in terms of financial limitations or like uh, shooting limitations or even around risking their um, life and everything. So I call it like th this can be called like under what um, Hamid Nafisi actually calls like um, diasporic Iranian cinema. And like Persepolis and the recent film Under the Shadow is that one. So yeah, because they're not um, facing, the, uh, they're not working under censorship, they're usually very critical of the regime suppression and that's why they get made actually. Otherwise, uh, they don't bother doing that. Um, they portray underground life, especially the youth. I will show you parts of it. The, the things that are not shown in the regular films, like the kind of parties um, and like drinking that like, happens in Iran and like the state denies it, um, or like the premarital sex that is very common now in Iran, but the state again like denies it. Um, these are all the things that like, they show a kind of like the underground life of the Iran's uh, modern society. And yeah, they're political in themes and characters, but unfortunately they still suffer from self-censorship. And part of it is because like some of the people who are involved in those films from the like crew to cast is, are actually working in the legal venue of filmmaking. So they want to still work. Um, they don't want to, um, that film just to stop them from uh, filmmaking. So My Tehran for Sale is one of those films. I'm going to show you just like a minute or two minutes of it. And then the trailer of the taxi, and that would be the close of the church. So um, where is that Dropbox link? I, yeah, I just want to show that um, what do we mean by underground life of the youth and why they get why do they get censored? So there's like two clips I'm gonna show you for that film. Is that like one clip is the very beginning of my Tehran for sale. And um, this is a party that you can see that is kind of like the Western, like American type of country that you won't imagine maybe that happens in Iran. Yeah, thank you. And then the second one is again like just a portray of the fact that premarital sex, it happens in Iran very commonly. Okay. This one is the beginning of the film. Sorry for the low quality, it's hard to find this film. There's no way that actually in the label venue you can shoot that scene and show it in theaters. 
um, like the drug use and, and drinking and everything, especially with women, is something that like state doesn't want to show. And then just like again, like this, um, there is no show of like sex scenes again. Like that's part of a self censorship they have. But um, this shows that um, there is a sex between the two main characters that we have, and they're just boyfriend and girlfriend. It's just. Yes. And this is again something that there's no way you can show it in the legal films. The morning after. And it's again about the immigration, about um, a, an actress who wants to immigrate. Yeah, and the guy is an Australian citizen, and that's why she is funny. Or like not having a job. This is something that you can't have. The underground films usually have like are based on like a relationship and how that actually uh, it's a kind of pretext to talk about more important sociopolitical issues. And again, it shows a better picture, especially of the Iranian youth. In terms of Iranian youth, Iranian underground films try to be closer to what happens really in their life. That usually they have like two kinds of life: the life outside that is like following the rules of the state, and the life indoors that is very different. So the last thing I'm going to show you uh, the trailer of Taxi. Which is going to be shown, um, I don't know if it's here or in another room. Uh, we'll screen it, I believe, in, in one of the main theaters on November 2nd. Right. Yeah, I've seen this film multiple times and like with actually like uh, American audience, and they all loved it. Um, and it's a great film. And it's pretty hilarious. So you will enjoy, you will have a good time just like watching it. You will laugh a lot and everything, and it's great. Um, Oh, it's about, so Panahi, one of those like um, art house filmmakers who, that I told you that is now banned from filmmaking, um, is just now playing the role of a cab driver getting th um, through, the, um, through Tehran and just like giving rights to people. So this is kind of
به نظرم بیخیالش شد I throw out the film, you actually a question that like what parts of it is actually staged, what parts are not staged. So it's kind of like interesting just to like even think about those things. And it's pretty accurate, like that critic that said that like it gives you a truer picture of um, Iran modern society than what you find in the news. Um, so the yeah, so just like to give a conclusion is Iranian cinema is still, um, as always, like from pre-revolution to post-revolution, has always struggled with censorship. And, but at the same time, it's a censorship that is negotiable, at the same time complicated. Um, it's, a, it's a rich and diverse cinema and productive in terms of the number of the films and influential on the world cinema. Um, I hope these all, this is a picture of like part of a cinema museum of Iran. Um, and I hope all these like kind of excite you to explore more Iranian films. And maybe you start with Taxi, which is an amazing film. And then you explore more. Um, thank you for your attention. It's actually the interesting thing about Taxi is that like you never know which part of the film is actually documentary, which part of it is fiction. It is presented as a like kind of maybe docu-fiction, a combination of both of them, but um, you don't know that like are is this passenger really a passenger that just got into car? It is shown to the audience like that that all the passengers are just like passengers getting on Panahi's car. But um, like one of those people is, a, is actually an actor. That's like, if you know, um, like Iranian cinema, you know that like he's an actor. So there's no, and he's playing the role of a, like, um, a, a person who is selling DVDs. So that is definitely a stage. Um, but like those women, um, um, or the, that guy who really wants to hang people for no reason, um, so yeah, so and the kind of dialogue that happens between people is kind of like, at least the dialogue, I don't think they're written. But again, you keep questioning which part is documentary, which part is fiction. And that's the interesting part about it. And there's another example. So if you see Kiara Sami's 10, it's an amazing film that has the same kind of quality and also close up. So Kiara Sami kind of started that. The actors get paid a lot of money? Do you have superstars? Oh, yeah. So we have stars. Um, um, maybe they're not paid as much as like Brad Pitt or George Clooney here. Um, but yeah, there are stars. Uh, they're like young stars. And, older stars, um, and they usually get paid a lot of money more than directors. Um, so it's kind of, in, in terms of that, it's very close to American cinema, yeah. Yeah, so that first clip you showed, was that supposed to be a, a romantic comedy? The one after the earthquake, and then the, the guy is going after the girl? And oh, no, it was just... Right. No, it's not a romantic comedy because uh, it doesn't start with two of them fall in love and then they separate and they come back. That's the like kind of like structure of romantic, like typical romantic comedy. But the film is kind of just about the life after earthquake, and these two people are maybe like the salt and pepper of the film to show that like life continues, even though there was a huge earthquake there, people are still falling in love. People are still want to have families. And, okay. and also, I know it's, I've been playing a, a Western classical oboe concerto. <laughs> yeah, I mean, is that used a lot? Right, Kiara Stami, like, usually didn't have someone, like, um, compose music for him. And 
usually he used um, jazz music, not here, but like if you like um, see his films, he usually just like used existing jazz music. And yeah, sometimes like this, classical music. Um, um, he, he's a, he was like a very like a good listener of like any kind of music. So when he was making his film, he could just like pick up just like, oh, that music matches this. Any other question? Right, that's the thing. That's like most art house films are more available with English subtitles, and mainstream films, especially comedies, are really hard to find with subtitles. Again, it's about that. What are the films that get outside of country? That art house films get a lot outside of the country. Then after that is those like um, the bridge between mainstream and art house films. So like a separation, Faraday's films are all available with English subtitles. And you can find all of Farhadi's films. You can find most of Kiarostami's films with English subtitles through the olive trees that I showed you. It's really hard to find. They are trying now to um, make a collection out of his films now. Um, but the mainstream films, the body of Iranian films are really hard to find with English subtitles, again, because they're not shown in theater, theaters outside of Iran that much, unfortunately. Um, there was a hand there before, sorry. How do we see some of these films? Right, so um, there are many of them available on Amazon, actually. Um, some of them on Netflix. And um, some of them, I have to say that just like to, there's some of them available by just streaming or YouTube. Um, unfortunately, if we want to get to see them with English subtitles, there's no other way. But there is one website that if you want to use that, this is an amazing website and you don't need Amazon, Netflix, or anything other than that. And it is IMV, IMV Box. And it's, there's, there are so many free films there, but the subscription is also like, like $3 per month. And it's a, kind of like a Netflix for Iranian films. It's IMV Box. IMV Box. And here you can see that like, if there is something like this CC, it shows that it is available with subtitles. So this is... If you, if you use this website, the good thing is that like that $3 per month that if you pay goes to actually run your film industry and to the producers, which is better. Um, but there are still, like, if you don't want to pay for it, there are so many free films. So you see these have plus. This means that um, they are not free, but there are so many free films as well. Yeah, so this shows that, for example, this is red carpet and it's free. And you can find like that this is a comedy. This is like a total comedy. Or like this one, The Facing Mir Mirrors, is about a transgender woman. So there are so many interesting films that you can find here that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you for your question. You had a question? I pretty much have the same question. Like, do you think films are available? Right. Again, I, in terms of like um, DVDs that would be available, I'm not sure how many of them are available. But this streaming, there are actually, and this is pretty up to date. So there are like 2015, 2016 films even here, and there are, they have like pretty old films, like from like 1940s and other things. Too. Right, so they, sometimes they get to festivals um, and they're pretty successful at festivals, again, because this is something new um, that the Western audience is not very used to see about Iran. 
So nowadays they're kind of popular. And just the fact that they go through that struggle of making film like without permission and facing all those risks, um, it's interesting for um, festivals. So other than the festival is kind of hard. They don't get really big theatrical distribution. Um, and that's why even that like the quality of the my Tehran for sale that I showed you is kind of a low quality because I just like downloaded it. It's kind of hard to find. Um, sometimes they're available um, on Amazon on DVD. Some of them are available, um, but so, like for one of them that I was actually um, writing a paper on Iranian Degas, so I had to contact the director to just like give it to me, just like give a link to me. So, yeah. Other questions? With all the different ethnic groups in Iran, is there more pervasive or typical Iranian music and which films would be most likely to showcase that? Um, to have like many different types of music? Oh, that is very like ethnic music. Um, so there is there's a film called Half Moon, Half Moon, and it's made by one of those like um, art house cinema directors who has now immigrated, unfortunately. Um, um, I have to write film Iran Bobadi. I can't just like Google Half Moon, of course. <laughs> so this is the film. Um, Half Moon, 20, 2006, and it's about a woman, a Kurdish woman, who wants to sing and has uh, problems because, like, woman, women can't sing in Iran. So he has, like, he, she, she's facing problems with that. And there's there's so much music there that like they just sing and everything. So it's a it's a very good film in terms of ethnic music, I would say. I saw a hand back there. Um, if you didn't have all of the credentials taken care of, and the film was produced, would you have been able to make the um, to just make sure that I got your point, so you you don't follow the censorship rules. Oh, okay, right. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> If you are if you are the filmmaker and producer, um, you you could like face um, it, it is considered kind of a crime. It's not written, but by the state it is an unwritten rule that it is considered a crime. And yeah, they could even like um, get into like jail or like sentence like to pay um, kind of fine, and it's not a small fine. Um, and they could actually, more important than that, and more common than that, is um, facing banship from leaving the country. It's, more, it's the most common way of punishment for making films without permission. And, but if you're in the cast and crew, um, there are actually some of the professional uh, like sound mixers, cinematographers, and other things that are engaged in those films. And I haven't seen any problems with them. They usually don't face any problem. In terms of cast, sometimes they face like um, temporary banship from like playing in films. Sometimes, but it's usually for the directors and producers. I, I just had—you said you're working on post-production on a film yourself. Could yeah. You, what is your film about? Uh, it's actually it's it it should it couldn't be considered Iranian film because I made it here and with um, American actors with a um, uh, American crew so it's kind of like American film I just happen to be Iranian yeah <laughs> but yeah it's it's kind of in terms of the content it's a surrealistic love story if I want to say it in one sentence yeah. Establishment in Iran, like establishment in America, like avoid the permits, 
Oh, you mean that you have a story that happens in Iran, but you go to another country and make it there to avoid the permits. That actually, um, that's what uh, this guy, the director of uh, Half Moon, Bahman Hawadi, did, and he went to Turkey. So he went to Turkey and made a film that, um, that was like very uh, political about like someone who got into like uh, jail after the revolution because of his political instances. Um, and Monica Bellucci is in it. And it's, um, so yeah, sometimes they do it. Uh, if, if the filmmaker has already immigrated and then they make films out of Iran, like what we see in Persepolis, and um, like under the shadow, or um, if they're second generation, like what we see uh, for the director of Eger Walk Home Alone at Night. Um, I call these things like maybe like diasporic uh, Iranian cinema, and I actually refer to Hamid Nafisi to that. Um, they're not underground cinema because they are not facing all those limitations again, as I said. But um, maybe um, so. But to answer your question, yeah, sometimes they do that, and Kovadi did that. And after that, he, of course, he couldn't uh, go back to Iran. They're actually like, um, to, the, there's less self censorship in those films, and there's actually a sex scene in that film. So, yeah. Any other question? Maybe we should. Any more questions? Maybe we'll wrap it up there. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.